the village and i used to drive to and from the building site and at some point people you know started waiting for my car like how they used to wait for a bus ki ye choti wali kali gaadi aayegi aur you know hum ko isme lift milegi you cannot uh, say no because you know they are your community like they are your uh, and then they were the people who were giving me fruits in return and it was a very very interdependent uh, sort of network and then if they were constructing something they would ask for something so it was a very mutually uh, symbiotic sort of relationship right. to another episode of Tiny Farm Friends podcast. This conversation long in the making is personally special. The pivotal theme of the podcast has been sharing stories of the mad ones, people having the courage to take unconventional paths. For many of our friends, our guest today, Aarti Dhingra is a mad one, someone who took the road less traveled. She is a role model and a personal hero. Aarti is an architect with a deep interest in ecological design and the visual arts. Her interdisciplinary practice based out of a small village in Uttarakhand in the central Himalayas of India explores interconnections between ecology, design, climate, culture and social identity. This conversation is about her inspiring journey of setting up her practice in a village in the Kumaon region of Uttarakhand. Today Aarti and I deep dive into what it means to build beauty. We explore gift economy, ethical architecture and how living close to nature influences creativity. And we discuss migration from villages to cities and vice versa and so much more. It is a long but powerful conversation. Listen to the podcast at a 1.5x speed for a faster experience. This conversation is for everyone who wants to live in the mountains and work closer to nature. Enjoy the conversation with the meticulous and diligent Aarti Dingra. So yeah Aarti thank you so much for agreeing to come on Tiny Farm Friends podcast. I know we've been wanting to do this for the last 6 months. and yes. since you told me about your story i could only say that maybe i am living that in a parallel universe in a parallel yes. world in uttarakhand you lived okay. a similar story in kumau i am i can so much relate to it now since i'm living it in gadwal maybe 3 4 years Absolutely. down the line yes and every time i talk to you it's super enlightening and so it's i'm really glad to have you on the podcast and i want to pick your brains on so many topics but before we can do that or dig deeper into your uttarakhand kumau story i would like to know your background like you were born and now you're here so what happened in between so okay in how much detail let's let's see um yeah. i was born in delhi and uh, then i also studied uh, we lived in gurgaon actually since a young age we moved to gurgaon because i was uh, having problems with pollution in delhi so my parents shifted to gurgaon at that time gurgaon was not what it is like we used to we had one single alone house and now we, when we look at pictures it seems like ye kahan hum kheton mein reh rahe the aur ab kya ban gaya uska now so they they're making like uh, these build of floors of uh, four story uh, high apartments mm. so i did my schooling in gurgaon and um then i did my architecture from spa delhi and um uh then i worked in delhi with uh, a professor ashish ganju uh, in ayanagar for about 2 years <clears throat> and uh, one and a half two years i worked with him uh, officially and then i continued to work with him even after uh, after that i worked with professor ganju because he came as our fourth year housing jury for in spa and right. um, there he uh, he talked about you know his new book which he had written just then which was called the discovery of architecture and um, he talked about how we've sort of in our modern times we've forgotten the value of architecture is actually to serve society and and so on and he uh, brings out in his books like some fundamental principles which are 
present in ancient architecture, ancient wisdom, ancient knowledge. And um, why have these been forgotten today, I, I, you know? And so that was my motivation when after graduating from SPS, like floundering what to do, who to work with, got a, a placement in some big firm in Dubai after college, but di didn't feel like going for it. Felt like working with a small studio. Um, so worked with Ashish Ganju sir, wrote to him. He liked my portfolio CV. He said, okay, come join. He said, I don't have a very standard practice. So you need to be careful what you are expecting. So why don't you come meet me? And um, then I went and met him. It worked well. And then I joined his studio. So I was working on this project, which was in Dharamshala, which is a nunnery called the Dolmaling Nunnery, which is Ganju sir's project since 20, 30 years, basically. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like a monastery, but for nuns uh, and uh, for the Tibetan refugee nuns. And there they were building a new school for, uh, for the nuns. So I was really fascinated working on a real architecture project after graduating from college. And um, um, this project was also in many respects very fascinating because, you know, it was somehow we were building on Buddhist principles. So bringing that into architecture was very fascinating for me. And there the working with Ganjusa, of course, was like a very, uh, very good, like very um, life changing sort of experience almost. And, um, and there the nuns were themselves building on the site, like they were the ones who uh, managed the uh, site coordination, building construction, all of that. So for me, this was very interesting because I was like, okay, like this somehow gave a very realness to the project that it was not like, you know, uh, we are designing it in drawings and some contractors are building it. No, it, it was really very real. And uh, Ganjusa always used to say that um, you should design your building in a way that the person who's reading the drawings and on the mason who's making the drawings can understand the order that you've created in your building that you know so much that they don't need to constantly refer to your drawings and they don't need to you know um uh, they, they kind of understand the rhythm with which you have designed so these things really stuck to me and i was also working with him on another project which was in ayanagar so ganjusa's office was in ayanagar only he had he had his office and studio there it's a beautiful building if you ever get a chance to see it uh, he's unfortunately Definitely. no more yeah he he passed away last year uh, because of covid unfortunately but um, yeah his his studio and his house is like one of the most beautiful buildings one can live in or experience or something so half of his house was uh, the home and half of, was the studio so we used to work there as office and um the other project we were working on in Ayanagar was the, an urban renewal project of Ayanagar, which is which again was like a decades long project. So uh, Ganjusa worked in this manner with all his projects that, you know, he used to, um, uh, they were not like just start and finish. They were always like these, uh, almost every project in itself was a research design lab where he would constantly learn with the community, develop things and build things and, and so on. And um, then after that, I once this Ayanagar project was at a certain stage almost um, um, ready, and this uh, the Dolmaling project had become on hold because the nuns had diverted their funds for some Buddhist festival. So I was a little bit like uh, not happy because I wanted to really uh, build, mm -hmm. like really uh, yeah. really learn construction and architecture and site stuff. So I, I told sir, okay, I'm going, but as soon as the project starts, I'll come back. You you let me know. I'm going to get some more experience in in hardware architecture. So um, that and then I also thought, okay, maybe I want to get a master and I, I was a little bit um, not very sure what I want to do, but I knew that now it's time to do something different. So um, yeah, that's when I applied uh, for other jobs and um, that's when I actually then moved to Kumau. So in between, there was a, a small workshop that I had done with in, in Kumau with an NGO over there and where where they were focusing on building rural homestays. So the, yeah. uh, um, these rural homestays were happening because, you know, the uh, NGOs or the government gives them schemes to make homestays because there's a lot of migration happening. So this as a way to curb the migration, they are given these incentives that you will give you a loan, you make your homestay, and then whatever income you get back, you can sort of uh, it, it will supplement their livelihoods and then you can also pay back the loan. 
so uh, as part of this kind of workshop we designed some rural homestays for a particular village this was a small workshop i did that and then came back and then later um i um well, when i was applying for jobs i found a job which was asking me to go back to that same village and it was somehow Super very yeah it was somehow a very big coincidence because that yeah. is such a small village like nobody would have gone there before and i actually knew the all the ngos what was the village. name of the village uh sitla okay yeah yeah so um very small village and the, the architecture company they were not able to very easily find people who would just you know pack their bags from the city and go move there but i said yes okay i will do it because i also wanted to and i was really keen on you know uh, i i knew the people it was a beautiful village i wanted to go there so i took the plunge i said okay i will i will go and uh, they were very happy because they found someone and uh, i knew i had some local contacts already so i think that was the the strong point that i had at that time um so and so that was from when i was born till I, when i got there now what's my, you want so, me to go further so first like i want you to maybe reflect back and uh, uh, tell me i'm sure like mr ganju was a gem of a person and now do you if you look back do you really feel lucky that you worked with him and your life took another course and if yeah. we talk about architecture pedo- uh, like pedagogy like because you will be- you graduated from an esteemed college in india right so what do you think were you equipped enough to maybe take up construction projects or do you think the whole education system that we have in this country is it flawed or what are your views on that okay uh yeah it's very easy to also say it is flawed but you know at the same time architecture is such a difficult subject it's a culmination of all the possible subjects one can ever imagine right like recently okay. someone was telling me that they have to design a building for animals so you need to know how animals would you know have their daily activities and all of that so i mean you you absolutely know, need to know everything to become an architect or you need to right. keep learning all of that everything you know of course it's not like at any point you will know it so uh, with working with danju sir was a very uh, definitely a very 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 life changing experience because um, uh, coming from this esteemed college he would this it in a moment he would be like tumhe kya pata tum to spa se aaye ho tumko to aise hi train kiya hai and i would be like okay like uh, you know people talk about sp in a very different way and ganju sir talks about sp in a very different way because for him these institutions are basically you know uh, where they give you very codified knowledge and where you are not allowed to break out of it and really uh, he used to always say that you know they train you in tools um, in all these softwares and tools but the biggest tool someone can have is their mind and right. that mind is not trained then what is trained like he used to talk like that and um so definitely it was a lot of unlearning when i was working with danju sir a lot of unlearning from spa but i might disagree a little bit with danju sir and i have said this to him also that it wasn't all that bad like everything that we you know of course college can't teach you everything it can't teach you a, a real life experience i mean now uh, there are universities which are beginning to you know do a lot of hands on build workshops and this kind of stuff it was a little bit missing in our uh, in my my time but um but yeah it does give you a little peek into what all is there you know and then beyond that it, it's also at least at spa it was a lot of learning from your peers that uh, you there is okay there is a substantial learning from your teachers as well but a huge lot of learning is from your seniors or from your uh, classmates batchmates and you know from the city you keep experiencing different events and you you know you do a lot of these studies which connect you directly to the place that you are in and uh, all of that so i yeah i mean there's definitely things that can improve but there's also a lot that it it gives already so but if you look at uh, the situation like when you pass out from the college 
Do you think there is a fear of building, as in yes. that you Absolutely. feel that okay, I am not ready yet to you know construct something yeah. or take up on a project? Definitely a fear in the sense that architecture is a very difficult profession, like to really practice architecture. So as far as I've understood, there are two different worlds that people branch into. Maybe they start with doing an architecture job because not everybody not. very few people are just you know go out there and i'll start my own practice so they start with a job now most of the times these jobs are very disenchanting in the sense that they might not be building something which is very fair or very you know working in a very fair manner and people are usually very disenchanted with that i mean i'm talking from just experience of friends and and colleagues and so on and of course there is the pay aspect as well um which is a whole other story in itself that why uh, why does it have to be a profession which where you study probably one of the longest as uh, as much as you you study to become a doctor you you study the same to become an architect and why is it so so less paid that's a whole whole other debate in itself and um, but definitely you know these are these are the challenges but the something very internal which i also faced was a fear of building that you know i thought yeah I, i'm you know you, building construction in college used to be my hated subject like i never used to attend those classes somehow used to topo those drawings to you know just uh, do the submissions and then uh, design studio used to be the most favorite and um, then when you like you like when i uh, started working on my own this was after i moved to kumau and i mean somehow that bridge happened like i realized that it's not like building is something very natural and you know when living in the city i had not been able to think like this i had always thought that you know this is something which other people will do like some contractors i think it's also to do with gender because you know there are not many practicing women architects who were who are always around or uh, there are okay architects but also contractors and also you know people on the site there are there are there is so much that women do on construction sites because um you but but their work is hardly sort of you know categorized in the work which gets counted or their, their work is hardly um counted as labor or um you, it hardly comes to the forefront basically yeah, i agree and, um, yeah. what you are trying to say and i'm sure like you must have faced a lot of challenges as a uh, women architect when you moved to kumau so coming back to that part that you chose a road less traveled and you unlike maybe your peers you thought of working in the rural areas and you ended up in kumau so i wanted to dig deeper into that story that how again you ended up there and what all experiences you had and what all challenges also you faced as a, a woman architect living maybe alone in that village yeah yeah definitely i i can share this with you um so i when i found myself at the building site i was posted there as an a site architect okay now being a site architect having no experience of being a site architect right i had, because i had worked only in nanjusa's office and we were working on a project which got stopped so i had no construction stage experience at all and there my job was to be on site and that site was also in terms of like weather conditions it was difficult because it was so harsh sun and it was uh, just very harsh weather being outdoors all day you're not used to it coming from the city and um, i was the only woman so for my parents also this was thing that you know from a safety point of view coming from delhi you 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 would always think that you know working at a building construction site being the only woman a young girl almost uh, 24 years old what what would you sort of uh, feel so i had come with that kind of um a uh, little bit fear a little bit just seeing okay how it, let's see how it goes learning on the job kind of thing and um there the contractor turned out to be a 65 year old very grumpy very patriarchal man who you know uh, first took me like beta beta okay uh, hum saath mein kaam kar lenge and all of that but then the project dynamics were also such that you know i had to convey the architecture needs right and the client right. was um, 
in another place. The architects were in another place and the contractors and craftsmen were with me at site. And you know, uh, anything that was coming from either the client or the architect, my face was the, the you know, the person that the contractor was seeing ki, isne bola, isko theek karna, isko pasand nahi aaya, or whatever, because they wouldn't know ki, the communication I'm constantly having with my boss or with my client and so on. So um, beyond a point and the project in its own way was justified that it was unfolding in a different way because it, they were building in a rural area and um, it wasn't a very top-down approach. They, they were coming with, you know, they were expecting some site-based solutions to come. So wanted to do a lot of mocking up and sampling and this kind of stuff and, you know, understand some things which might work in the city, but might work differently here. So that back and forth was expected, but for the contractors, it, uh, it was not easy to take a 24, 25 year old girl who also looks like a child to, you know, come and tell him ki ye apne galat kar diya hai, even like right. super politely. Um, so, that was super difficult and even more difficult because I was not very confident of Sahi kaise karna hai. You know, like it's not like I'm coming with some experience ki main bata dungi aapko sahi kaise karna hai. Mujhe sikhna bhi aap se hai and mujhe aapko bhi thik karna hai. So it was a kind of a very challenging job. And um, so the fun part of it was a lot of learning. Like I really enjoyed it. And there were some uh, young people at site like carpenters who were kind of my age group. And, you know, they were, they were very uh, good to bond with. And then, so they, it worked really well. And in terms of, you know, um, also the craftsmen, they were really old, you know, these Kumauni craftsmen who work with stone. So they were really right. very, very skilled people who, you know, sometimes I would just like to, in my idle time, just sit and watch them making their, each stone making with the, uh, this pointed hammer. So, and then by default, I was getting involved with their community living and their, their way of living. So meanwhile, where were you put up? Uh, when you reached I was, there, like, how did you find a place? So and... I found a place based on my own context. This turned out to right. be a kind of a, blessing in disguise because the clients were supposed to help me find some lodging and support my rent and all but it turned out they didn't help me and mm -hmm. but as a result what happened was that okay I found my own lodging and then when I found my own lodging I found my own community and then I found my own way of you know being with the community so half of my life was the work site but half of my life was the village life and uh, that became a very important learning at you know what we are doing on the building site because the village community is such a small community everybody in a day or two they knew ki acha ye wo madam hai jo us wali site pe kaam karane ke liye aayi hai aur you know ye roz wahan jaati hai and i would earlier later i brought my car also there but earlier i would take the bus to go or uh, take a lift from like hitchhike with people and all so it was a very short um, period in which everybody knew okay something is being constructed this person is an architect, even though many people didn't know uh, exactly what an architect is or like how different it is from a site supervisor or an engineer or something. They didn't right. really know that. But uh, I was then solely part of the village. Then some of the Masons were having grandchildren. So they invited me to these festivals of, uh, you know, uh, these uh, um, uh, dance festivals of when they celebrate the grandchildren's birth and all. So that then, and then also the weather is constantly changing. So you see uh, how the seasons are changing. Every season has their own local festivals. So they, they, they're also behaving differently. In the winter, the work timings are very short. In the summer, the work timings are long. Uh, at some point, they used to tell me that, you know, um, when we were casting the concrete slab, um, we were trying to plan when to cast it. And they, they told me Makar Sakranti ke baad karna because that's when the days start to get longer. Mm -hmm. So that's when the frost will not uh, uh, come on the RCC slab. So all this very local knowledge, traditional knowledge that they have since generations was kind of playing a lot of uh, relation with construction. And the, I could kind of relate their whole ecosystem with, with what we are constructing. Mm -hmm. So would and, it be... Uh right to say that you experienced all the seasons maybe i mean noticed and keenly observed them for the first time like how the moon cycles are 
how the it's, sun movement is and and how absolutely. much did nature influence your creativity there absolutely a lot i think uh, i think that coming then it connects back to your first question of that fear of building right the moment you find yourself completely in nature in a way that you know you're totally immersed in it and you know you it's a very tactile feeling you're working with your hands all the time you're working with your body your your mind works in a very different way and at that time somehow architecture is a very natural thing it's not like it's as natural as a bird would make her nest or it's mm-hmm. as natural as you know ants would make their ant hill or like you know just taking up some mud and making a chula to put protein in it right light a fire that that obviousness became architecture for me and this kind of changed what spa had taught me architecture because their architecture was like a profession which was like for professionals which was for you know to be done in a certain way another thing like you know we work so much with drawings but when i was working with uh, craftsmen at site they don't work with drawings they can't even read drawings they don't know what is a section like it took me so <laughs> it was so difficult for me to ex- tell them imagine there is something you have sliced it now you are seeing it from here now this is a section but um, for them it would be so easy to you know just take a stick draw it with on the mitti and be like yahan pe ye hai they would their imagination only is different so we would work yeah. a lot with mock ups and models and that would be so fast and so good and then i started making a lot of physical models also rather than drawing i think because of the section you also encountered a problem which you tried solving it later regarding the water <laughs> tanks or something right yes. yes true 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 yeah so even though like architects would work with their best intention like the people most of the architects i was working with they were coming with the best intentions of you know making something sustainable something good but just the the entire world view there is so different that even the best intentions are sometimes not understood or you know that uh, misunderstood because people think also working with natural materials is inherently sustainable now mm-hmm. we were there working with stone and wood which are which are natural materials so in terms of carbon emissions they are much better to use than uh, say rcc or steel and circularity and they would go back to the earth and so on so that's that's one uh, tick already for the materials but i slowly learned that you know the wood that we are using is coming from pine forests and these pine forests have a whole ecological social ecological connection in the in that society that these pine forests are basically they are not native they were planted by the british or they they're basically they were they are not indigenous to the area and they are actually invasive so what in the, what that means is that uh, wherever these pine species are growing they don't let uh, the the native oak rhododendron kafir these kind of species to grow and uh, these other species which are broad leaf species they are basically you know they uh, enhance the soil water quality enhance the soil nutrients they allow uh, they they provide their leaves for fodder so they are very much more uh, part of the ecosystem in a more key keystone species kind of way that you know they they uh, the the cattle feed on them the humans use them for fuel they cannot use pine for fuel because it has the lisa and yeah. um they they nourish the soil they uh, they 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 uh, support community growth of forests like they allow other species to grow but pine doesn't allow other species to grow and uh, so if you see a pine forest it's very barren you'll see only pine needles in the in the floor of the forest and if you see an oak forest or a rhododendron forest like how you see in like some reserved forests of mukteshwar or um these areas you'll see it's lush green and it has a lot of undergrowth also it has different height growths also it has a different soil quality you feel a different smell of the the nutrients of the soil and you feel also um a different temperature in that uh, area because of the microclimate that creates versus the microclimate this creates yeah. so and um, this pine forests why it came as an alarming realization to me was because in the summer time uh, these famous forest fires of uttarakhand which 
everybody is aware of they were everywhere like they came to towards houses people were spending nights to you know for, fight forest fires and um it's it's become a common thing in their life that is the cause of the pine needles right that they catch exactly uh, it's fire actually quickly. yeah it's actually a very complex phenomena because the the way the species the pine species propagates itself is through creating these forest fires like the pine cone is designed in such a way naturally that you know it f- opens up when uh, a fire comes and it spreads its seeds and it has a rolling nature so it rolls down uh, uh, rolls down the hill and spreads its seeds and pine are you know something called pioneering species so they grow the fastest and the other species grow slower so it kind of shoots up really uh, fast and doesn't allow other species to grow so the fire actually burns all the other species because the other species are quick to catch fire pine's bark is fire resistant so it causes the fire burns the other species doesn't itself let, let itself burn protects itself propagates itself so it's almost like you know uh, you can imagine like human characters in these trees also like pine chikka yeah. ped kuch hai banch ka ped kuch hai to exactly this is that how... was coming into my mind like some kind of yeah. uh, evil villain Okay. Yes, Everybody exactly. Has its own uses. Yeah. Exactly. So not just that that it propagates itself through these forest fires. Uh, in terms of like its natural um uh, um uh, uh, propagation, but also it attracts lightning the fastest. So if there is a thunderstorm, if you there's a pine tree on your side, it's likely to catch lightning, catch fire, fall, whatever. Its roots are kacha, so they it can fall. easily with wind um uh what else so, yeah it doesn't provide uh, any fuel to the uh, sorry any fuel to the uh uh the local um chulhas and uh, it doesn't provide any fodder to the cows but all it provides is us uh, timber and resin which is a huge contributor which is a huge revenue generator for the construction industry and uh, that is like a big chunk of the revenue that uttarakhand generates so um this became a big part of their ecosystem and this kind of connection and i mean people are so used to this that forest fires happen and this is happening but you know it's still it's very connected to the fact that every year when these forest fires happen there there are habitats being destroyed of uh, local animals and you know um, so you see a lot of wild boars coming into farms uh creating chaos not letting them farm anymore you see sometimes leopard attacks you see um there are you know a crazy amount of monkeys uh that that are there which do not let people farm anymore and these sound like right now just things we're talking about but there there actual problems of people that you know a person is really the monkeys have caused a lot of havoc like they've stopped farming because of the monkey havoc and they need to keep dogs which chase away the monkeys so this this stuff. brings me to the next question that i am assuming that you were there building a house for somebody uh, who's trying to maybe move from city to the rural area or maybe just making a farm house and at the same time you're talking about the animals and how maybe their habitats are being destroyed and maybe they're venturing into the farmlands and maybe that's causing uh, some kind of problems to yeah. the villagers and maybe leading them to you know reduce in their efforts in farming so yeah. i want to know about migration so both ways so again it's like a very vicious cycle but probably inevitable i'll uh, what i understand is that so like we spoke about the pine forests right that they are invasive they don't let native species grow because of that farming cannot happen and because like soil quality degrades farming cannot happen so fa- like farming used to be one of the main livelihoods of the people over there and of course happening in a globalizing world and urbanizing world it's also kind of happening in parallel where people's aspirations are very much towards the cities and um towards what the city the, the life that the city offers and um um so what happens is that when farming cannot happen people look for livelihood and they they migrate out so you will find these satellite cities nearby like haldwani bhawali all these 
places which are closer to these villages that mostly the the younger men of these uh, homes have sort of uh, gone out there for work or this kind of stuff and the people who are usually left behind are the women and the elders so that's actually uh, it's um, more difficult than it sounds because uh, when you leave behind agricultural farmlands they actually don't work when they are you know fragmented so if because uh, these uh, traditional homes used to be community living so their farms were also connected they used to be like row yeah. houses and now when a patch of people have migrated out those certain patches have become non cultivable like the beach ka patches are you know it's more difficult for them to cultivate on it because their quality and so on so is more system is not so, resilient enough right now in exactly America. exactly and um, and then so first of all this system became fragmented because half of the people went out now that difficult system is, is left to be managed only by women because you know the, the men younger men have all gone away and um um also the elder responsibility is now uh, uh, to take care of the elders is now on the women and then um in terms of like certain social traditions and all it's usually the women who go and fetch water so the the natural sources of water are you know found scattered in the topography the, the like uh, natural water harvesting systems called nollas which where people go and collect water for the day and it's is usually a, a good enough work for like and i mean it's usually the women mostly the pahadi women who who go there for um, fetching water so and now because of this again construction activities and the degrading of the soil the nollas are also drying up so you don't always find water in the nearby nollas so the work that the women has to do is also kind of doubled up tripled up so it's become like a manifold problem for a particular gender as you can see like she is not only not getting the benefits of you know migrating out which the men can easily get that you know they can find jobs and opportunities but she is also suffering the uh, the dis- climate disasters that so are happening so having there. having seen myself like how much hard work a pahadi woman does but can you yeah. also trace what you observed like how her day looks like An average Bihari woman uh, living in the village. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, they would. She would wake super early in the morning, take tend to the cows, go fetch water, cook, work in the farm, uh, go fetch water again, and uh, they they also go fetch fuel wood, go fetch grass, and uh, it's a lot of physical labor work. Sometimes they also work as labor on construction sites. but they still get paid less than men uh just because of uh, gender and uh, then they they also take care of the kids they also take care of the elders and um yeah there's a, there's a there's a lot of uh, disparity in in how men and women are behaving there like the men are actually suffering from lack of work because they get addicted to alcohol and all of this easily because they have nothing to do they have uh, you know they are just sitting there playing games drinking alcohol and there's a big addiction to alcohol problem that uttarakhand is facing uh, uh, in in men specifically and uh, the women are f- suffering because of excess work and the men are suffering because of lack of work so you can see how the the ecosystem flux is sort of impacting the two genders differently and um where i was living was actually a local hospital also over there so one of the doctors there was a very close friend of mine and he used to tell me that all the women that are coming um with back pain and you know uh this pain is because of how hard they are working they're like they're so old but they're still doing so much labor uh, labor so they ha- had like cervical problems and this kind of problems which they've taken very easily like lightly they don't take it seriously and um they also have a lot of uh, breathing problems because they constantly work on these uh, chulhas yeah. which Okay. uh have a lot of smoke so yeah definitely the pahadi women have a very like a 
a strong role to play in the economy, in the local economy, but it's not given credit for in the agricultural economy as well. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah, unequally doing most of the hard work. Yeah, I'm sure I've seen it myself and I, yeah. I'm really astonished the amount of work they are able to pull off in a day. I am, it's like, like yeah. literally like Wonder Women. So we a traced uh, some of the reasons that maybe men have shifted in search of work to maybe these right. uh, towns or maybe more developed parts of Uttarakhand. Families also shift to cities because lack of schools, lack of hospitals, lack of infrastructure, and maybe they are not into farming anymore. So this is, this we traced the path of migration from rural to city. Now I would also want to understand from you, like why city people are coming back to rural areas. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we stopped the cycle. We stopped talking about the cycle where, you know, the rural people are moving out and land is now fragmented. As a result, you see many, many ghost villages. So you'll see some entire villages, you know, like there's one village where I was living called Diari. It was a village of, it, it is a village of crafts people who build with, you know, uh, toon wood, they make wood craft. And now, unfortunately, even the last surviving craftsman who was really old or around 90 years old has also passed away. So there's no way to, they can pass on the craft to someone or um, so on. And um, so when you see these ghost villages, now the economic impact this has is that land prices are really low. So uh, the land pl- prices are so affordable that a, a middle class urban person can easily afford sort of uh, buying land over there and having their dream holiday home, mountain home, this kind of stuff. And also because it is a touristy place, like it offers you a good views and there is a, the, a strong tourist uh, aspect in it so um, and it's also not like mainstream tourism it's not like Nainital or it's it's somewhere where you know you can be secluded but still enjoy like a good hiking and uh, you know small homestays kind of experience so people um, I mean uh, so the kind of urban people who I've met who uh, live in the area are of mainly three different kinds so uh, one of them are the people who have come as NGOs there. So they really are, you know, they're not, they're not expats, but they're like immigrants who've, who've come there as to sort of uh, uh, work for the rural people. And they've set up hospitals there, they've set up schools there, they've set up uh, livelihoods units there, they're training people in education, they're training people in uh, making jams and products and uh, soaps and selling their products and giving a lot of much needed healthcare, which, you know, in rural areas, they can't access. So they're taking their uh, um, mobile medical units in um, remote places and providing healthcare. So that's like something that's really, really needed also. And um, uh, the other kind of people I've seen there are also returning um, uh, people returning at, at an age of retirement or you know who were who had once migrated out but they're coming back with you know hopes of doing something in their own area um, set, setting up there with the knowledge that they've gained in the city and you know trying to make a livelihood back again so that's the second kind and the third kind are you know uh, people who have just bought land, are building holiday homes, but not live, going to live there. And will probably uh, hire some local people to be their security guard and um, come there during vacation time. So um, yeah, like it's usually the third kind of people who don't live there that create certain structures, which in themselves are kind of ghost structures now. They are like, so on one hand, there are these abandoned ghost villages, which the villagers have left out. But on the other hand, there are these huge, uh, you know, uh, monstrous, ugly RCC structures, which are half done, just left abandoned because someone couldn't afford to complete the construction or something happened or some land dispute happened. They haven't finished it. But um, yeah, these holiday homes are just lying there. But, you know, it has fragmented again the community lands because they build huge boundary walls and this kind of stuff and put CCTV cameras. And so, it's, so it's what, are the, yeah. 
what are the tangible and intangible effects that brings to the existing ecosystem uh, if we talk about right. third kind oh, um yeah like uh, so it does have i mean i think all these kinds there's constantly an exchange like the rural is constantly exchanging with the urban the urban is constantly exchanging with the rural and they're, they're constantly you know uh, um uh, sharing values economy there's so much of exchange that's happening so for example um, one thing that i saw was the bringing in of airbnb the concept of airbnb is coming in because um, so some of the ngo people of course because they they come from the cities they had put up their local homes on airbnbs so now in airbnbs they they would charge a higher rent than you know a local pahari family would charge for example so they also saw that uh, this is how much rent we can also get from our uh, room so why should we give it for you know if we can get uh, uh, give a room for 2000 per night why do we need to give a room for 2000 per month so it it was a exponential sort of um, economic change in the ecosystem which i also faced because when i was living in the village for 3 years uh, right and when i moved in i could find a nice uh, welcoming home the local pahari family would you know also give me food and also appreciate the fact that someone is staying with them long term because it's nice to have for them a guest and um, but the moment the airbnb system started uh, when i had to look when i had to find a place nobody would uh, they were like yeah it's okay but you know will you move out if we get airbnb guests will you and nobody was willing to give me a room on a monthly basis but they were like you know uh, 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 like it was such a short term rental system and this is what airbnb has done in many cities as well and to the rental economy like, so I, that's something, i, I yeah. can understand their situation also because living in there i am sure there have been there has been always a fight for resources and if such an opportunity yes, comes yes. i'm sure they would love to grab it but i've been also thinking on about this a lot about gentrification and maybe how you know maybe as urban people coming into rural areas definitely they bring some economic value some other kind of values also and as you mentioned there is a lot of exchange happening maybe there could be better fair share models that we haven't thought of right now yes. yeah, which are absolutely. more sustainable for both yeah. somebody is coming in yeah. and somebody is already existing there absolutely absolutely and um in terms of this exchange like uh it's also so one thing was uh, the economic factors that have come in and this has kind of drastically changed um the the ecosystem of the place and again it does come back to that divide between the men and women because you know the the change in the economy is okay it is bringing new opportunities for a lot of people in the area but sometimes the women are not even in a position to benefit from those opportunities because they are so caught up in their you know um that very space of place and space of flows we we in urban planning we call these um uh space of places where you're sort of very rooted and where you you need to be in that place for your daily living and you know you're working in space of flows as people who are like us who can have zoom calls and who can have you know yeah. uh, uh networks and this kind of thing so um yeah they do not have the access to the space of flows at that moment that time and um it's something that like you rightly said that if one is conscious about uh, you know what exchange we're bringing in we can do it in a good way and you know we can not just simply gentrify it but rather have a but have a nice like, exchange like just to add on to it i believe that maybe because we have also made this transition to rural life somewhat so what i notice and we've been interviewing such people who are either doing it or wanting to do that so i believe mm-hmm. that we were earlier talking about the circular nature of village life you know how cow dung yes. uh, is very circular and how sustainably they use wood and all that system but now they are also rural people are also somehow getting detached to their own you know indigenous wisdom and yes. they are maybe adopting western methods which have failed in the western society as it is but when people the conscious people that you mentioned were 
who come from city without any background of a village life or without having engaged with yeah. nature they are coming with the spirit yeah. uh, and the curiosity and the inquisitiveness to the rural areas yeah. which actually rekindles the uh, the circular nature in the rural people you know when they Absolutely. ask them about farming and how they used to Absolutely. source food and ask them to you know teach them their techniques so in a way maybe they're rekindling all the values Absolutely. that are now yeah. uh, getting lost yes definitely yeah that's that, that's true i really agree to that and um yeah like um in terms of also learning from this whole cow dung loop that you've said i think you know not taking it literally but just understanding the circularity in it the fact that it is a closed loop system that you know it something was created some it was used it a different it was processed and then it went back into the earth and then it was created again just understanding these systems and understanding what systems we are having now uh, and the the fact that they are not closed loop and where are they kind of growing towards or what are they becoming that itself is like you know, and then trying to close them because um um uh it's just it's like a it's like a long long process because now what we have is a system which is not as simple as one rural unit it is multiple you know and there's hardly any differences between indigenous knowledge and the west uh, what we call it because it is constantly again exchanging that we don't know what is indigenous anymore we don't know what is the west anymore at some level we do okay because uh, there are some practices and which are done in uh, uh, villages but yeah it's a it's a very complex uh so basically the lines so, are getting blurred qu quite quickly right yes exactly and it's a it's it's become a systems thinking problem which you know needs needs a lot of uh, closing the loop kind of answers and like yeah. you rightly said that you know it's uh, conscious people who are coming there who've who've seen what fails in the cities and you know who can sort of bridge those gaps because they can they, they can make the two worlds meet in a sustainable manner that's that is like super 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 needed right. crucial right so now coming back to your project where did that fit in mm -hmm. and uh, like how did you advance on that project uh, that project i was just an employee working as a site architect but slowly i realized that you know i want to work with the rural community also because um, uh, most of the times when i was working with the uh, people who were moving in you know from a very diff from a very luxury oriented background from the city they were expecting those luxuries in the villages also and um, it somehow just didn't feel natural uh, living in the village that those luxuries are even possible because in nature you you can't afford those luxuries like to give you an example i was living in a small small hut i'll share with you pictures later maybe you can put it in also because it Definitely. will give a good idea um so i was living in a small hut which was completely dependent on rainwater and um, like here now working in germany people are like we don't even use rainwater for recycling it in a way to you know consume it or drink it or bathe with it but there we were using rainwater for everything because we had no choice so um either rainwater or we would have this local nala like i told you to we used to go fetch water in there and uh, we had to really be really really uh, uh, use it really scarcely and um but in some of the building sites we were building swimming pools so for me this was a big mm -hmm. contrast uh, um that you know uh, i mean it's just that like uh, sitting somewhere else you're sometimes not aware maybe you have the best intention to make a swimming pool as well but you know maybe you're just not aware of the harsh realities of the place and um what happens is that you know in hilly areas especially water is a very scarce commodity and it also is a very shared commodity because you know um, if your land is if your house is on top of the hill water will flow down so if you extract a lot of water at the top of the hill or you use it then the villages downhill will not get that water and um, 
you know that then we are talking about equity and resource sharing and all of that and um um yeah so this these issues were very real issues that you know people were kind of facing on a day to day life like some rural people came to uh, some of my construction sites and they would say, say no you cannot construct anymore because we don't have any water to drink and and so on so you know like how we talk about ethical fashion now it it came to me that you know what are the what is the ethical side of architecture like uh, what we are doing something that's legal but is this ethical and um, you know so i started questioning on that level that you know what is what is relevant architecture what is ethical architecture sustainability is was a you know a ground line but it was when we sustainability becomes such a broad and sometimes misused word that you know we we can almost call anything in any way so many ways we can call things sustainable right but um, when you really root it to these particular ecological factors then you really know that you know if you're being regenerative you know if you're helping the ecology or if you're destroying the ecology that's very clear so um that was the the kind of uh line that was something that you know then i begin exploring those those thresholds that you know uh, what is that kind of architecture which is you know beyond sustainable it's it's it goes to sort of support livelihoods it goes to so, sort of right. support the economy this kind of stuff and um yeah yeah so now you came from city so do you think that you were bringing any value to the whole rural system how was the response of the community in accept, accepting you uh, as somebody who's come from it was a lot of it was a lot like i think there was because there was so much construction happening there in the area um first of all i made very close friends so some of my closest friends in life are now my village friends and um like who i'm constantly in touch with and um like, who i met them there i was living with them and it was a it was a very like almost like community living that you know we were living together eating together everything so um and some of these friends were also working in local ngos so uh, i have a friend who is a forester and from him i learned this whole you know story of the pine and the oak that i'm sharing with you and um, some friends were doctors some friends are you know really working with their hands building stuff and um, uh, some friends are artists so uh, like having this very close knit community um, was a very enriching experience and um, i think the second factor was that you know there is so much construction happening there that people would just be like are ye kuch bhi chota sa you know if their uh, uh, kitchen ki lakri ko deepak ne kha diya hai to aarti ko bula lo kaise theek kar raha hai you know everything from chota sa se leke bada kuch bhi just ask me how to do it so i did feel that you know i am in a position coming from the city that i can impart some value at the same time i also learned a lot some many things directly and many things very internally also like you know when i was uh, always questioning this um, the fact that using natural materials is that always sustainable uh, and then we also worked on some projects with abi and cob and you know very natural materials so that was also a very fascinating experience to also bamboo so you know learning with materials that are like more in harmony with nature and you know which are causing lesser destruction and very local uh, impact that you know it will just you build something and it'll just go back to the earth when the life of it is over so um i was also questioning you know the the values that we are taught as architects of you know having everything completely maintenance free and very permanent something that should last 100 years 50 years very concrete ideas that we have concrete materials concrete ideas and you know breaking the breaking down these sort of very uh, concrete definitions but trying to understand things which are more so did did there yeah. come a point where uh, while introspecting that you question the relevance of being an architect for maybe building dwellings yes 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 i think uh, i from an architect i just became a facilitator instead mm. of being you know the the 
protagonist uh, designer how we are portrayed in you know like uh, the architectural community it became more of you know just facilitator who is kind of coming with some knowledge which can guide people help people facilitate things but they already know a lot they already have so much wisdom they know many things in many cases it was also to draw the lines because with a lot of urban clients this happened that you know uh, uh so it, for me the spectrum of rural and urban was completely different so when i was working with rural people i learned a lot from their way of building because it was unfolding in a very beautiful holistic processes and that the process of unfolding was creating something very beautiful and wholesome but with urban people there was so much influence of you know pinterest and you know like this kind of things that uh, are very on a very superficial intellectual level but not a very deeper emotional need of the space that will tell you yeah we want something which is visually like this which because they are coming from a very urban background they have the words to talk about these um, faces and they have the design language so to say but they kind of miss out on you know, the essence of what the space should do and in like, the end what so, turns out is yeah so yeah. so like No, what are the yeah. like you rightly were mentioning and comparing to approaches so i just wanted to come to that point like how different did you see uh, the approach like one as a as a conventional architect that he or she takes in the city versus how the rural uh, craftsmen or rural builders or mystery maybe they do it yes. while building their own houses or somebody else yes. and i remember uh you mentioning yes. in the talk how they could you know maybe just by touching the soil they could you know like tell you that whether it's good enough to yes. build it or not yes. so what is yes. the relationship met, between like, materials uh, and different approaches yes i met one very uh very wonderful person nishikant bhai he is a craftsman who works with mud and he could really tell me like he used to touch the mud and he used to tell whether this will go one floor or two floors whether this might but that's now that you think of it it's so obvious right because you know uh when you feel a material you know its quality like you know that if this has silt or clay you can feel it if it's the how it's crushing in your hands how it's making a ribbon in your hands these tests we also have these feel tests so like sometimes you know in the city or in architecture training or just general urban living we kind of really disassociate from a very intuitive side of what is inherently present in us as something that we can feel and tell we've kind of totally abandoned that and we've become like you know we we or we we won't believe it like we just won't acknowledge it we won't believe it won't follow that uh, voice but we will just uh, wait for this material to go to a lab to get tested and some uh, me- through a mechanism which will then tell us the result uh, so uh, not to you know uh, i don't mean to say that that lab test doesn't have a value but you know that l- we would be in a so much better position to understand the value of those things also if we were more in touch with our intuitive sides and you know understanding materials in a very intuitive holistic way that you know these are gifts of the earth that are touching us and you know understanding it as as that rather than you know something external from us or you know um i find it very difficult to talk about these processes but um because what i, really, I understand yeah. from the approaches is generally i mean i might be wrong and different people take different approach we can not definitely generalize but maybe in conventional architecture you plan the building and you like you're yes. done with the elevations and all the planning and then you come to the yes. point of selecting materials and material palette yes. but i think when it comes to rural areas the material guides a lot of the construction and it is yes. more intuitive in nature more instinctive in yes. nature and people in the rural areas are much more confident about their instincts absolutely absolutely and you know i find it similar to like let's say if if you're uh, very mindfully cooking a nice meal first you'll see what vegetables you have what ingredients you have and then okay this is what i have and this is what i can make with it without following a recipe and you know this uh, something you just follow a process which is a very wholesome process okay ab ye dal diya maybe now the next thing that should come that feels right that's the next best step to do that should be done 
and then if you if you stay true to the process something beautiful and wholesome will come out of it that's mm -hmm. the the ancient way of building right that's that's how most indigenous societies and most uh, rural societies work in but in the urban way of building or cooking uh, it's basically that you know uh, you saw a recipe on pinterest now you want to make it so now if i need one ingredient which comes from finland i have to bring it from finland you know so but where is the self involved in it there is the mm. self is totally disassociated from it so this idea of the self is i think what is missing between um you know uh, building something which is very beautiful and wholesome and you know very in in harmony with the ecology rather than you know just building something which is intellectually can be termed sustainable nobody is questioning that you can call it you know you can say that even in the countries like germany where i'm working now i've noticed like the definition of sustainability is something you know okay this is how much damage we could have done to the earth but we did this much so this difference that we've done that we've saved you know jo humne wo ehsaan kar diya dharti pe that is our sustainability basically so i feel that you know that sense of self is missing in this and um, interestingly like this when i was feeling this also even ganjula writes about this sense of self with the community a lot in his works in the discovery of architecture and i recently did a, a post graduate uh, diploma in a, a, it's called building beauty basically it's based on works of christopher alexander and um, taught by family and colleagues of christopher alexander also and he also talks about a process in which you know when you when you stay true to the process of unfolding you kind of create something which has a lot of your yourself involved in it rather than uh, it's very difficult to talk about these things but maybe you can check out the program and uh, uh, it's it, it basically talks about beauty and wholeness in architecture from a from a holistic point of view rather than a you know aesthetic point of view because it's it's kind of integrating aesthetic and function and calling it wholeness basically mm -hmm. and uh, because we as designers we tend to divide the two we say ki you know function form follows function function comes first but if you look in nature if you really understand nature deeply like a tree or a leaf you know there's it also has a function but it also has a form but it also has beauty it also has wholeness so when you probably say form follows function the function we forget the fact that you know the space needs to make us feel very emotionally comfortable and you know emotionally wholesome that is also the function of a space it's not just that you know you will sit and do your all your anthropometric uh, uh things which are satisfied with you know you you need to also feel feeling is also a function so we kind of forget mm -hmm. that feeling altogether and um, so so um yeah so this I, it was I a pretty that, i believe that you've been exploring this theme throughout your career maybe i think your thesis topic was also on similar lines and yes. now after pursuing yes. your masters in germany and you took this uh, uh, course in post graduation specialization and i would like to deep dig deeper into uh, this course because christopher alexander uh, is definitely someone who every architecture student designer or anybody who is planning to construct anything should read uh, i yeah. strongly believe that so maybe yeah. let's uh, dig deeper on building beauty his work and what mm -hmm. beauty means to you yeah so um so uh, like i told you already when i was in kuma and uh, trying to explore these uh, a different kind of architecture which is sort of let's say more in harmony with the ecosystem and you know um the life cycles of the materials and uh, the deeper needs of the clients rather than you know something that they just saw of pinterest or these kind of things which is trying to really understand the like how to design in a way that really really deeply understands people rather than you know just superficially understanding you know aesthetics and these sort of very visual um languages that designers talk about um so i mean in my practice i was exploring this constantly and like the role of the architect had changed to the role of the facilitator and um 
um then i wanted to sort of um uh, get a little bit into teaching so i i had actually begun teaching a little bit like i, I had gone as some guest lecturers in some design universities and architecture schools and all so um i felt that okay maybe it makes sense to you know um learn a bit more go a bit deeper into this theoretically also understand how these ecosystems are working i wanted to do like a like a master level study on this particular area go understand how these ecosystems function and um, and what is the right way to build in such areas you know answer that question basically so that was constantly a question and um, so so i mean luckily i had a scholarship to come to germany uh, i where i studied uh, my masters which was in integrated urbanism and sustainable design so that was a pretty uh, rich experience in itself uh, where we went deep into our ecology and ecosystem design and thinking and um urban planning all of that um and um uh but at the end of the course something was missing like you know there was um i also did my master thesis in kumao where i uh, compared these you know social ecological systems of the the rural areas versus what they are becoming because after the migration and all the economic change that's happening so um and the whole gender thing that i'm talking about all of that came out as uh, as a result of interviews with people and really spending time with them and talking to them and um the stories about the women that i'm talking about these came out uh, through interviews and um um yeah and a lot of ethnography and you know just just spending time in the area so there was still something really fundamentally missing that you know okay now i know how the, how all of this makes sense but you know where how do you proceed like what how can an architect design you know what is a way to design in which that it resonates is in harmony with these areas so i was kind of um, maybe again it was a a, a big coincidence uh, that ganju sir used to be faculty at building duty so um, and like ganju sir has been my guru mentor throughout uh, ever since i work, worked with him so he was also guiding me with my master thesis and um, yeah like i said that delta covid wave which was horrible for all of us um, uh, yeah like uh, uh, ganju sir then he passed away unfortunately during that um, that covid wave uh, it it was in the middle of my my thesis and uh, yeah there were a lot of unfinished discussions like i was you know speaking with him about all of this and my thesis was coming to an end and yeah suddenly he was no more and uh, you know but he had always talked about the building beauty program to me and i was actually working in his office when the, they were designing the building beauty program and he was part of it so um for me constantly it was a thing that you know he's engaged with and i want to know more about it and i want to at some point get into it as well but after he passed away this kind of came as a natural sort of choice that you know there were there are so many unfinished discussions that are remaining to have with uh, professor ganju that i want to have and i want to you know i want to go deeper in it so i kind of uh, that's how i got into building beauty because um, almost as a tribute to ganju sir and um, and i'm really happy that i did because uh, it kind of connected all these worlds that that are uh, that i was exploring and um, and you talking about wholeness which is again connect the self and what you create so uh, one famous line which christopher alexander is which is also written on the building beauty website is that making heals the maker and uh, so when you're making in a way that is truly in harmony with the fundamental principles of nature it has a very healing effect on you and yourself and your conscience and you know the other way around that um when you feel so uh, mindful and aligned with what you're creating and you're able to see the difference between something that is truly wholesome and beautiful and remember when i say the word beauty i'm talking about the beauty that we talk about in terms of leaves and trees and not like the convoluted term of beauty that is uh, misused versus you know distinguishing it between these very these styles of architecture that you know we mm. are minimalistic or we are modernistic or we are 
sure like these styles have their own place and yeah i think know, that conversation has gone viral in recent times too like the conversation <laughs> yes, between true. the minimalism and yes the true. loss so, of detail the idea the essence of what i'm trying to say is that there are certain things which are you know preferences which are personal preferences of how you want to dress or how you want to uh, whatever but you know there are certain things which are more deeper like on a neurology level that your your body needs something now if you you know eat a fruit you will get certain nutrients or certain minerals from that fruit right there's no questioning that you won't get it uh, similarly like uh, when you are in a certain space our bodies respond neurologically there is like enough scientific evidence there is there are biometric tools which help us understand that you know our eyes our mind our our skin our bodies perceive certain spaces as more comfortable more you know emotionally comforting for our, our neurological systems rather than others and uh, why i'm constantly focusing on neurology is because when architects say form follow function this is something the sensory experience of it is something that is totally lost like we totally disregard that we just end up creating you know very minimalistic structures which okay i i uh, there is a certain uh, preference the intellectual preference that it is coming from but you know on if you really connect to a deeper level of what the the human body needs at some many levels it falls short um this also like the the kind of people who teach building beauty are people who work directly with alexander and you know who were their contemporaries or students or um um i don't know partners um, they and i mean it's very fascinating to see the life journey through his books that you know he was also constantly exploring what is a meaningful way to build so he, you know even professor ganju he was also constantly exploring what is the meaning of architecture like he also used to do these uh, talks architecture and society constantly questioning what is the relevance of an architect what is the meaning of architecture critically very radically questioning the role the architect plays in the society and you know what is the, the ecological what is the social relevance of uh, the responsibility of an architect and he used to always say that you know architects are very much needed in society but not in the way that we're working now in a in a very different way so probably you know more as facilitators or more as like the ayanagar work that he was doing that no architect would do that work he used to always say that architects hate to talk about like because he was dealing with sewage no architect wants to talk about waste management and sewage and this kind of stuff so uh, yeah like it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting to really understand like coming back to your earlier question of you know questioning the relevance of an architect i believe in the standard way that we are taught definitely we should question it but we also know at some level that now that we uh, we are trained to you know um integrate so many different subjects of knowledge that is basically our strength right and that strength a lot of people can benefit from and um, so in that way we can sort of bring value to to many ecosystems and and in many ways and um, yeah so for me building beauty was kind of a uh, uh, um like not something that is ground breaking or eye opening because at some level i was also within myself and i was exploring questioning those but it kind of gave me a very thing that you, you know to see works of alexander who has you know found methods and learn his methods because he's gone through that journey and he's developed certain methods of unfolding and understanding beauty and he's given us some objective tools basically so there's something very fascinating which he's devised um uh, called the mirror of the self test so this okay. is something which is you know uh, these days people talk about human centered design and everything basically that human centered design is is comes down to the mirror of the self test which is you know um uh, catering to something very deep within your your human self and it it's very uh, related to how well you know yourself and how well you're willing to be mindful of yourself because it's it's a test which shows you two things and let's say two spoons or two uh, cups or you know two buildings and then it asks you 
a question which is super introspective to say which one of these represents all the good bad ugly beautiful sides of your your true self you know which one of it has that and um of course to answer such a deep question you need to be in touch with your own self right if you if you answer it superficially you won't answer the correct answer and um, somehow like objectively when people answer this most of the people choose one particular answer like it's a, it's a, it's not a subjective thing that which is your true self it's an objective thing so that's where it comes down to neurology that you know if for a second we forget the ideas of beauty that are taught to us by society like you know um i did for my bachelor thesis also i was designing some spaces for children for specifically juvenile delinquents that foster sort of rehabilitation and emotional healing and these kind of spaces so i did an experiment with children from younger classes like fourth fifth standard even younger second third class and uh, higher like secondary school like uh, 10th 11th 12th class students and i asked all of them to draw a school what school means to you and um of course like as you would imagine as well all the elder students drew like a very uh, modernist building i gave all of them colors okay and the elder ones didn't even use colors they did pencil shading gray and white and black with a very uh, school bus there and you know very uh, all the regimented parts of the school were there and when the younger ones were drawing it was full of color full of vibrance full of emotion and full of you know much more meaning that you know i'm more, more like their right. friends were there rather than the systems and the mechanisms their friends were there their parents were there their teachers were there so what i'm trying to come down to is that as we grow older like what was the conclusion of this study this primary study was that as we grow older there is a certain influence of course there is a certain influence that what what we are taught is correct and what we are taught is beautiful what we are taught is you know even in architecture we are constantly looking at references on the internet or works of architects who are from a generation of you know a certain style of thinking be post the world war and all of these have impacts on how we feel and how we think and how we are brought up but uh, if you really go to a child and ask these things there are no none of these impacts they, they don't know about the impacts of the world war they they will just tell you the the truth like the truth which is actually in harmony with nature but you know the, the, this is the space which, which nourishes me and um, somehow in the mirror of the self test that comes out through all of us like if we really we don't ask arti or raghav but we ask that inner child what space is you know th- then the answer is always objective so that is something that building beauty gets into and really again talking at that intuitive level it sort of strengthens your uh brings you more in close with your intuitive sort of um way of feeling and you know working and making which is a very very rare thing in today's world like very mm-hmm. few people do it and so many people are disassociated so i was really really grateful to have done that uh, that whole one year course and um yeah it i think like i also wrote an article about it and i wrote something that uh, you know bringing someone in touch with their intuitive mind is the biggest gift that you know someone can give to another person so and i mean this is not mm-hmm. a new thing you know everybody albert einstein also said this that it's uh, He, there's a famous quote, uh, quote by Albert Einstein, which goes something like, "The rational mind is a faithful servant, and the intuitive mind is a sacred gift." And we've learned to sort of honor the servant, but we've forgotten the sacred gift. So this is not something new, but it's just something that you know keeps coming through. I, I see it through Ganju sir's work. I saw it in the in in what I was exploring in Kumau as well through my own journey. and then i see it in alexander's work and you know it's it's something that and i see it in your work when you were talking also so that it's pretty fascinating to keep coming back to that so there is some truth in it yeah i mean what you have said right now like there's so much wisdom to absorb and uh, so many relevant questions uh, that you like asked and i am humbled that you could mention my name with ganju sir along with alexander i mean there i wish i had a mentor like ganju sir but uh, definitely now christopher alexander is like a 
hidden mentor like i have been reading is yes. spartan language yes. and yeah. uh, i would definitely would want to read like more of his later works the nature of order that you had mentioned me earlier and yeah. so who would you like yes, to I'm recommend sure. this course to like i'm sure listeners are quite yeah. intrigued about this course yeah i feel uh, so nature of order is the 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 magnum opus that we are referring to in the course as well and but the last book or the last book that i know is called a battle for the life and beauty on earth and um in this book alexander actually describes the struggles that he went like so he he calls it two world systems almost even ganjusa used to call it an ecological world view this way of thinking this way of being the way he was working he used to call it an ecological world view that even in his book the discovery of architecture he's presented it as an ecological world view that you know uh, this is an alternate system of living it's an alternate system of thinking and even in alexander's work um, he describes the struggle to make uh, make beauty and wholeness and life buildings that support life basic these kind of buildings that are, that foster your neurological comfort your 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 happiness he calls these buildings that support life and um, he describes the struggles that he went through in our modern day world systems to be able to you know carry on these processes like you also told me the other day that you know when if you take on other projects how do you make sure that you are there physically to sort of uh, carry out and like like we were talking right now so we need to somehow make these two worlds meet unfortunately because that's that's where the starting point would be we can't completely um, you know imagine a parallel world and then be very happy about it but not to anything about it so yeah i would i would recommend it to anybody who's interested in you know even the, the courses for architects graphic designers artists software developers anybody who's remotely interested in understanding wholeness as a way of life basically and you know not looking at fragmented view of things but looking at whether you're a writer whoever it's it's not limited to only architects or anything like that and um, people who want to engage with making things um, and you know understanding that fundamental question of how do you make something in the right way and uh, the the universities and the schools there are so many schools of thought which are you know conflicting each other and uh, you you align or you become your own identity which comes out of ego again with most architects and um, so you if at some point you're questioning that and you know you're trying to find a, your language or you know that a language which kind of resonates with nature or language which resonates with with fundamental principles so the other thing is that when we say we are building with nature we only think of building with natural materials right but this kind of building when we talk about wholeness it's not restricted to materials it's also about the process that you know the way you you're kind of aligned with the a process which is rooted in fundamental principles of nature so yeah i would just say just check out works of alexander that would be a good start yeah definitely and like i have been also going through unlearning process in the last few years and questioning a lot of things that i have been taught yes. and questioning a lot of processes as well but yes. coming back to you were mentioning mentioning different worlds right and you are someone who has been flowing on and off and very fluently and seamlessly into both city and rural life so how are you currently you know like balancing your work uh in kumau and simultaneously you know working in germany and how do you yeah, see yourself in the future so what's the vision <laughs> good question i do see myself working back in in kumau or back in india definitely uh, in the very near future um germany is like a, a stint because of i got a scholarship i wanted to come study here also explore the other side of the world and you know when i was in kumau at some point i felt that i i need more learning i felt that okay i i want to only intervene when when, when i'm sure of what i'm doing so I, at that point i felt okay it's good to get a masters um so so i came but you know now um 
I, I do see myself uh, working back there. I am, in fact, you know, the the advantage of working in in uh, rural areas or working in the kind of projects that I'm doing is that they are, they are so slow because we're working a lot with uh, natural materials like stone and which are very labor intensive and uh, uh, craftsmen are making it. So sometimes it takes years for a building to come up and um, and then the pandemic happened. So in between that, this um, that's when I did my master's. Um, but yeah, I definitely am still very connected. Like I'm constantly talking to my team there and my contractors there and, you know, constantly doing video calls. And that's why I, mean, I'm, I think I'm able to, it's not a, a very easy thing, but I'm able to manage because Europe offers like this work-life balance, which everybody's talking about, except that, you know, when I need to balance the work in life, I'm managing like, Germany work and Kumau work, so I don't have any rest, which is not a very sustainable thing for me. But um, at the moment, I'm that's how I'm managing it. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's that's how so, it's going. Great. And so we talked about beauty. We even talked about natural materials, and we talked about migration. But one thing I would want to know from you, because you also worked on uh, various projects for the rural community right there, like uh, not for people, somebody who's coming from a city and building a mansion. But so in cities, generally, the transactions are quite commercial, right? So how did it yeah. work for you in Kumau? It's so interesting that you asked me this because we should really talk about this. So, yeah, so when I left my job, which was paying me, I wanted to work really for the rural people. And then it became a big question that, okay, how do I sustain myself? But uh, fortunately, I didn't have many demands and the cost of living there was not very high. And um, all I needed was shelter and food. Right. That's that's what you need, basically. You need shelter and food. So I worked with one rural family who were designing their homestay, who said, okay, you know, you need to help us in designing our homestay. Now, I felt very shy in asking them for fees because, you know, they're making this homestay for their supplementary income. And if even if I ask fees, what kind of fees should I ask? It will not be enough for me to also pay rent. What should I do? So I said, okay, you know what? Um, you can just make me tiffin every day. So like, because, you know, I, I was working so much, I had no, no time to cook. So I said, every day you make me food and I will come uh, to see the site every day. So this was an age that happened and it, it was so delicious because, you know, Kumauni Pahari meals are so, uh, like, didi bana ke didi, it was like the yummiest food you could ever ask for. And plus you would get also a uh, surplus of fruits and, you know, seasonal uh, um, surplus all the time. So that was a very kind of um, uh, sort of a gift culture that I was working on. And with another client, I was working in exchange for accommodation. So I, they, they wanted to build something on the site. They said, Ek kamra khali hai, tum rehle na. And you know, tum hume thoda help kar dena. So I was like, okay. And you don't know, pass pass the. So ek ek mein rehti thi, ek ek mein mujhe khana tha. So you know, I was just uh, sort of surviving like that. I mean, like, by saying this, I don't mean to glorify unpaid work of architects. Like by no mm. means I want to glorify that. But what I explored through this was a, like we were talking about different world systems that, you know, if you think in a parallel world system where how the economy works, that, you know, um, if I was a resident of that village and I didn't have other aspirations, this is something that was working in a very mutually benefiting way that they would give me much more than I needed and surplus of food and accommodation. I was well taken care of and I could also work in return for this. But again, like I said, the whole differences between that, that battle for beauty that, the, it, it, that compares the two world systems, then you, you need to survive in an urban world system at the end of the day. So then it had a limited lifespan working like this, but it allowed me to, to explore like a, a whole different model of economy, you know, like a, almost, it was like a, it was like a gift economy, basically gift culture. So, and then uh, talking with my forester friends, uh, we used to relate this with how um, the trees worked on, work on gift culture, like they exchange nutrients in their roots and all of that. So it was a very fascinating experience to, to see that, okay, this kind of economy is rooted in nature. Like this is not very different from nature. You, it's a healthy exchange of, I can offer you this service, you can offer me that service. So it was a very healthy exchange. 
and yeah it was a very very different model of architecture practice social design i would call it <laughs> yeah i mean sounds very interesting and i am sure like you were maybe fortunate to experience this kind of gift economy setup because our system we moved definitely a lot far from uh, these kind of sacred gift economy that used to yes. persist yeah. in earlier time. i think you also need to take that step you know at some level like i know so many people who might be in the same position but not have to, because i have so many friends who told me that you know if we were in this position you would not have taken that step uh, that uh, to you know still work on gift economy or still do but i i think it's just that one step if you really take it and that's that's also which you deeply feel again with that self and intuition and all of that there's something that that living in nature for a long time does to you that you do start believing in 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 that voice and you you know you you think okay this is the right way to go it makes you feel safe that you know you will be taken like, care of like like nature like even nature you know there is a lot of interdependence for exchange of new things exactly. exchange of resources Absolutely. and similarly yes. in especially in remote areas it becomes more uh, like a survival thing you know like you have to help each Absolutely. other maybe if there yes. is a wedding you need to help you know get the chairs for absolutely. the wedding or you need to help yeah, cook yeah. because absolutely you, you have no uh, their help you know. some day yeah absolutely absolutely that's how the system like i used to developed. yes yes like i used to have my car there in the village and i used to drive to and from the building site and at some point people you know started waiting for my car like how they used to wait for a bus ki ye choti wali kali gaadi aayegi aur you know humko isme lift milegi you cannot uh, say no because you know they are your community like they are your uh, and then they were the people who were giving me fruits in return and it was a very very interdependent uh, sort of network and then if they were constructing something they would ask for something so it was a very mutually uh, symbiotic sort of relationship i think symbiotic is the right word that you used yeah know. yeah so yeah. i'm i'm sure like like in between all of this you must be posting on instagram or on social media and that yes. must have painted a really rosy picture for your friends yes. but Uh, what were what are their reactions and what were your realities and challenges that you were facing in your personal yeah. life yeah oh my god it was so different it was so different because um you know sometimes my friends would be like oh i am so jealous of your life i envy your life like you know so whatever this kind of stuff but actually reality is you know very challenging like if they would come to visit me they would not be able to survive for more than 3 4 days they would be like to yahan pe kaise reh leti hai it's so difficult you know um they would really not be able to survive and they would be like okay we are going back it's nice to come for a holiday coming for a holiday is very different from really living in such a place and uh, you know simple things like where i used to live was like a 15 minute uphill walk from the road so where you park your car you need to constantly uh, yeah, walk and um, andhera ho jata tha jaldi and then that area also has leopards and it also like people do um, say uh, like put your they put their dogs inside and it, like they uh there have been incidents of you know dogs that we know that have been taken away by the leopard and all of that so it's not like uh i mean it has its own beauty and its own charm but it does have its own uh, um like when i was working at the site it was so hard because there were no there were no toilets like where where would i go uh, you know simple things which you don't even question in the city and uh mostly i was working with men so i would be the only one who would need a toilet so things like that were difficult then eventually i had to take my car because uh, a lot of uh, like uh, traveling was really long and uh, um, challenging and um, and then there were of course these like pest attacks and like at one point my whole body was filled with you know these uh, i don't know some pest or something from dogs or something like my whole whole skin was like had this uh, infestation or whatever which i had to come to the city and get it treated because uh, this was there and then of course there are like these leeches if you walk in the walk in the forest yeah. there are these leeches so, and spiders and i mean urban people are not used to this and they they would just scream and i mean i was actually one of those urban people actually you know it was so funny when i came from uh, from the city when i just moved in uh, 
there was this uh, night jar do you know this this uh, bird this night jar which makes this noise like like a beep 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 <laughs> this kind of noise it makes yeah, okay yeah. and okay and then i was sitting with this uh, bunch of people uh, who uh, like my friends over there and like around a bonfire or something and i was like I don't know meri landlady kaun si machine on chhod ke chali gayi hai kya kuch inverter chal raha hai kya chal raha hai and you know you can't just think that that beep beep could be a bird like it it's you can always think it's a machine and so i mean our minds function in very different ways than we are you know with nature and without and um, but a lot of people also ask me don't you feel unsafe i like don't you feel unsafe with um living in a forest and because i was living on a in a hut which where you know one kilometer around it was nothing um so with like a big dog mowgli uh and they they were asking what don't you feel unsafe and then it made me realize that you know somehow walking even at night with that big mowgli who is like a leopard magnet for uh, that area i mean it was somehow so feeling unsafe from a leopard was so liberating you know than compared to feeling unsafe in delhi from like a man you know that 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 there was a fear for sure but that fear was a very liberating fear like that i'm afraid of nature you know but i'm not afraid of uh, someone who can cheat me or someone who can you know uh, uh, stalk me or whatever this kind of stuff so that that even that fear was very raw and that fear was super liberating i think yeah i can only try to understand that but now i'm <laughs> sure your journey was quite challenging one but a beautiful one and a lot of memories to ch- uh, cherish so before we end i would like you to maybe you know share some advice for people or students designers who are maybe you know planning to make a move to uh, rural areas uh, from urban areas and what should they keep in mind or maybe how can you know maybe they become part of the community or what kind of values they could bring to the community yeah i would just say that, you know don't go with any pre uh, predefined notions of how it should be just go with the flow and just see you know you, they will find their own community because if you if you go with certain expectations it's very difficult but just just go and see what's out there for you and just um just go with the the intention to explore yourself like this i would definitely say that you know get to know the rural community get to know nature but also get to know yourself through that journey and i think then the journey will take over i think that's uh, that's how it will should be great thank mm-hmm. you arti and thank you for sharing all the wonderful stories and little anecdotes and there has Thank been you, a lot of wisdom to absorb from this episode and it all, <laughs> it's always wonderful talking to you and because especially i read a lot of Thank things you. and i really enjoyed this conversation i hope the listeners do as well thank you for listening If you enjoyed the podcast please consider subscribing sharing and leaving a comment your comments and feedback are highly appreciated